Welcome back everybody. Today it's the turn of the Renault RS20, a car the Renault needs to perform, don't they? They need this car to be a massive improvement on what happened last year. This is an organisation putting a huge amount of money, a huge amount of resource into this Formula One project and yet last year they got beaten by their customer team. So is this the car to do it? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, only time will tell obviously, but this car like many, it's an evolution of what's come before, but perhaps too much so, in my opinion. There's some real key differences. There are some very obvious visual differences, but what I want to show you today is some of the areas they've focused on perhaps are at the detriment of some of the other areas that they haven't. Well, let's start with the front end, and the nose cone is clearly a massive difference. Last year, Renault had a very, very wide nose section on their car, and they have moved to follow the trend, but they've gone perhaps more extreme than most in going to a very, very narrow uh, nose cone section. I've talked about before that the complications of that mean that they are uh, have to do a lot of work in making sure this thing passes the crash tests, uh, in terms of the structure of the nose cone, which obviously they've managed to do, otherwise it wouldn't be allowed to test at this point. So they've managed to achieve that. Um, but what I really want to show you, and look, the reason they do this, by the way, the reason they've gone for this narrow nose section is really about making a, a clearer path for the big vortex, the Y250 vortex that I keep talking about that combines up off each of these inboard wing tips. And, and when I quickly explain that, these wing tips here, each of these elements, the pressure difference between the airflow passing over the top of the wing and the pressure of the airflow passing underneath. The one underneath has to travel further because the surface is curved. It speeds up in that situation. That's Bernoulli's principle for those that are in interested. And when it speeds up, the pressure of that airflow lowers. So the pressure going underneath each of these elements, and this is the same for pretty much any wing, the pressure going around the longer distance speeds up the pressure, sorry, the, the flow going around the long distance speeds up, the pressure lowers, and that means there's a big pressure difference between the underside of each of these elements and the airflow passing over the top. Now, when you get to the tips, the trailing edge of these, that airflow, that big pressure difference, well, they roll over to spill into each other. And so each of these wing tips creates a vortex where the flow spills over the edge and rolls over, starts starting to form up a big spiral of airflow. And each of these wing tips is carefully positioned so that each of those little mini vortexes or vortices rather combine into each other to form a big powerful vortex, the Y250 vortex, known because it's 250 millimeters from the Y axis, the center section of the car there, 250 millimeters out. That's where this big vortex starts to build. And because this is such a crucial vortex in the work that it does further downstream, having been passed through the barge boards and on uh, around the, the rear end of the car, this area is really important. A lot of people move their suspension up high, I've talked about that, to give that clear pathway through. But the narrower nose cone is another method for opening up a very clear channel to allow that to pass through uninterrupted. It gives more space for that big powerful vortex to, to build up and pass its way uh, along the car. So that's one of the pluses of doing it. That's one of the, re the benefits of doing it. Um, this cape, I'll come back to, to why I think they've perhaps not done it in the best way in a moment. But this is a cape that we've seen on lots of cars now. Uh, this one coming very far forward though with a great big inlet, if you like, forming a tunnel section. And as I've talked about before again, this is about separating the flow that goes underneath, creating a and almost like a tunnel, funneling that airflow in towards the front of the floor, really important part of the car. But this opening here, this inlet, is about catching the flow. As it hits the nose cone, the flow spills over the edge, rolls over the side. Now, of course, much of that will be gathered up and, and sent underneath the front of the floor there. As we come further up, the same thing happens. And I've talked about in other videos as well, I'll link some up in the corner as well, where I talk about the S-duct, the, the flow spilling over the top of here, which is destined to head, head into the top of the floor, the, the, the barge board area, uh, the guide turning vanes as well, becomes slow moving, it becomes turbulent as it spills over the edge. This is the S-duct entry point, which is designed to gather up some of this, this flow, slow moving flow that's passing over here, send it through the S-duct, 
and out over the top and again I've explained that in, in previous videos if you want to go and check some of those out around the other cars. Um, so that's what's happening there. There's another little duct back here you can just about see uh, right underneath the nose. Now that duct there I've got to fit a picture to show you in a moment I think is actually not an S duct uh, inlet but actually a, a cooling inlet for either driver cooling or perhaps some electrical boxes further down the chassis uh, but I'll show you where it goes. But what I really wanted to show you with this picture around the nose cone and how they've narrowed it in is really around this area here, the transition between the nose and the chassis. And what's really interesting for me and a clear sign of how Renault are definitely focusing on certain areas but definitely saving money in others They've used last year's chassis. This is the same chassis that, that essentially formed the RS19 from last season. Now that was designed to take this very, very wide nose cone. Just look at the transition between the wide chassis and the narrow nose and how, well, brutal that is. There's no, there's no smooth transition. There's no kind of design thought gone into that, that's really a bolt on. And I've got another picture that really highlights what I'm talking about. Just look at this. This is the difference between McLaren, who have designed a chassis specially to take this narrow nose cone that they have, and the Renault, which is using last year's chassis with the narrow nose bolted on. And just look at this. I mean, it's, it looks like such an afterthought because that's what it is. Now, the aerodynamic deficiency in this area Clearly there's going to be one. I don't suspect it's the biggest, it's probably not the end of the world. But, you know, and also you can see that duct a bit more clearly on this picture that I was talking about there for driver cooling. Um, this is something that I think really shows what Renault are up to right now. And this is probably something that me, for me, that is a little bit of a warning sign with Renault. This is a manufacturer. Uh, in our sport. You know, there aren't many of these teams, like there's Mercedes, there's Ferrari, Honda have a manufacturer-like relationship with Red Bull, but this is a team in Renault that have a that gives you a distinct advantage in that you're able to put your supposedly bigger resources into a, a car where you get to design the entire thing, the power unit, the chassis, the aero concept, everything is being designed together in conjunction with each other. So you you effectively have the the, the capability to do the best job of integrating it all together in the most perfect way. That's why Mercedes were so dominant early on because they did the best job at the beginning of this hybrid era in that area. And look, Ferrari have the same opportunity, but Renault also have the same opportunity as well. But budget, I mean, you know, you can talk about people's budget as long as you like. Renault don't have the, the Mercedes or the Ferrari type budget, but then if they're a manufacturer in this sport, why are they a manufacturer within Formula One? Because if you're ploughing what for them must still be a huge amount of money into a sport of Formula One, putting yourself on this global platform, and yet you end up being the worst of those four manufacturers in this sport, is that good PR? Is that a good return on your investment? I can still see a scenario, and, and I hope this isn't the case, but I can still see a scenario where Renault are no longer involved in Formula One beyond even beyond this year. I hope that's not the case. But look, they have no drivers in contract for next year. Uh, they have no customer engine partners beyond this year either. That's, you know, the McLaren deal has gone at the end of this season. There's definitely a scenario I can see where Renault leave Formula One. I hope it's not the case. Anyway, I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Perhaps drop me a line. Um, but look, I thought that was a really interesting view where when you design the chassis to, to go with the narrow nose, of course, it becomes much more profiled, much smoother transition. It's there, it's, it's, it's part of the thought process. What we've got here is something that was absolutely not part of the thought process and very much an afterthought. And when you have an afterthought on a Formula One car, it can never be better than thinking about the whole thing as a, as a global concept from the beginning. Okay, moving slightly further back, some really nice work. This is something that's really positive for me. Lots of really nice detailed work around the barge board area. Not necessarily revolutionary, uh, as I say, very much last year's chassis, but lots more work now in, in detail. And this is again following the trend of Formula One where the thinking now has become far more detailed in this area. But look at what a work of art these pieces are. They really are quite incredible. The thinking now has moved between having single pieces in any of your aero 
platform to having lots of pieces that combine with each other. As I said before about that, things like the front wing tips, combining vortices to spin up into one great big or more powerful vortex is a much more effective and efficient way of controlling flow around the car. And all of these pieces are definitely designed to work in conjunction with each other. Um, very similar in terms of this part of the side pod, so nothing groundbreaking in this area, but they have made a few changes further back. Now just taking a look at the two cars, so the RS19 from last year and that's this year's RS20. The biggest and most obvious difference to me is the, uh, the shaping in of the rear bodywork just after the side pod. Nice slim side pod entry. Uh, last year they had a much more pronounced undercut. This year they kind of followed the trend of a, a Red Bull-like uh, where it slopes away and there's less of an undercut but a much more gradual sloping away of the rear bodywork. And one of the problems from talking to people that I know in the paddock last year that Renault really suffered with was some aerodynamic stalling towards the rear end of the car where areas like this were suffering flow detachment. And that can happen when you have such an extreme undercut like this, such extreme changes in direction on the surface. It is possible you know, to get flow separation where the flow just simply can't follow at certain speeds the contours of the bodywork. If that happens, it starts to, to the, the flow starts to break away, tumble around and become turbulent, messy, and ultimately draggy. Um, so that's one of the issues that Renault had last year. And this concept, this idea here, I suspect is much more about trying to address some of those issues where they had, uh, at certain speeds, they had this flow detachment and therefore the aero around the rear end of the car would have been stalling or, or certainly been less effective than it would be if this whole area was working more effectively. So there you go, I think that's pretty much it. Other than these kind of changes here and here, they have made some changes to suspension. Uh, they talked about, you know, entry instability on the car last year where the driver had no confidence at the early part of the turning phase. They say they've addressed that through some suspension changes. It's almost impossible for us to tell just from pictures to see what that might be because it could well be internal about how the suspension handles the car under braking and under initial turning. So we'll see how that plays out over the early part of the year but this is a car that they have evolved the areas that they think weren't working too well for them, but definitely continued with the areas that perhaps are not going to make too much difference or perhaps that they know necessarily weren't not working for them, if you know what I mean. It's a money-saving project, this. And yes, you can look at it and say it makes some sense. We've got 2021 on the horizon. Why go all out designing something new for 2020 when it's only going to be useful for one more season? Well, the reason you might do that, particularly if you're a manufacturer, is that you're already falling behind your customer team. This year, everyone else will still be taking steps forward. So if you haven't taken a giant one, you could end up being even worse than they were in the championship last year. Racing Point already looked to have taken a giant leap ahead of the rest of the midfield. I hope that this isn't a nail in Renault's coffin and I'm not going to try not to judge it too harshly at this point because only what you know the only thing that really matters is what happens when it hits the racetrack but some slightly worrying signs some encouraging signs but some worrying signs of Renault as a whole and their future potentially their future in Formula 1 let's hope I'm wrong